Hello there, welcome to uh, my name is Peace Itimi. I'm currently the training manager at Wild Fusion Digital Center. So what I'm going to be teaching you today is going to be the fundamentals and concepts of digital marketing. These are things that I have been doing for the last four years day to day. I'm going to show a lot of concepts to you. I'm going to talk to you about the buyer's journey. I'm going to talk to you about marketing functions and how it fits into the buyer's journey. We'll talk about different digital marketing channels. We'll talk about some tools you could use in the fundamentals of digital marketing. I will also compare traditional and digital marketing together. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a lot from it. Um, come with me on this ride, shall we? So first of all, concepts. No. On a concept, we'll talk about in the inbound marketing versus outbound marketing. What are the differences and what are they? I will also talk about what digital marketing is. I'll talk about different types of media. I'll also talk about different types of marketing. All right? So let's start. First of all, what is digital marketing? Digital marketing is simply the marketing of products and services using digital channels to reach customers. The key objective is to promote brands through various forms of digital media. In a layman's term, digital marketing is simply using the normal marketing promotion of goods or services your brand using the electronic devices and electronic media like social media and other technologies and techniques that internet has brought to us. Right? That's what digital marketing is simply. So what you can do outside, what you can do traditionally, what you can do with flowers, what you can do with TV, what you can do with word of mouth, it's bringing those same strategies but this time using digital channels to do them. Right? Um, then let's go to inbound and outbound marketing. Inbound, ma uh, inbound marketing is the process of attracting leads by providing content that is helpful to them and will organically lead to engagement. What this means is that when you're talking about inbound marketing, you're focusing on generating content that your target audience as the people who you want to reach would like, find interesting, find relevant, find educating or enlightening. And when they see those kind of content, when they consume your content, video, images, audio, they get drawn to your brand because you have given them some level of information that they already like before. Now, the inbound marketing is a pull strategy because you are controlling your content and drawing people in to your brand, getting them to love your brand, getting them to understand what you can provide to them using content. So it's a pull strategy. Now, the opposite of that, it's the outbound marketing. Outbound marketing is the opposite. It's simply about showing content to as many users as possible to increase the chances of reaching an interested audience. It's a push, it's a push strategy. What this means is that you are not longer generating content to get people to get interested or to get people engaged with your brand. Rather, you're just putting out your content, promoting your content to reach as many people as possible. So inbound is pull join them in and outbound is pushing out your content so think about inbound marketing as um blogging and you can think about outbound marketing like using paid media right just creating your content not really thinking about joining to your brand but getting as much exposure as you want these two concepts are going to be things that you're going to do throughout to join in digital marketing sometimes you want to run campaigns that are focused on content generation and getting people engaged and getting people to love your content other times it's going to be about gaining as much exposure as you want and that's outbound marketing but it's important that you understand these two concepts and know when uh, when you're using which of them and when to actually use them another concept i want to show to you is different various types of marketing we have um, we have the interruption marketing we have the behavioral marketing and we have permission marketing what is interruption marketing interruption marketing it's simply a it's the concept it's similar to unbound marketing it's simply interrupting what people are doing and showing them your ad so for we stand when you see you go on a website you go on a blog say like kg blog or louis supergirl too exclusive you go on their blog and then you see like a pop-up advert that you really have no control over right those are interruption marketing there are things where you, people are going through their normal behavior on the internet but then a content from another brand that they're not aware of that they know exactly find relevant shows up on their screen and they can't control right the idea is interrupting what they're currently doing um yes it works definitely it does work but it's not the ideal world right the idea is not to just interrupt people with content they might not find relevant the idea is to understand their behaviors and get your permission to market to them and that's what leads to the other types of marketing like behavioral marketing now behavioral marketing is taking insights taking data understanding people's behavior what are their interests what are things they like how long do they spend on internet what channels do they spend their time on what kind of content they like to um, consume understanding their behavior getting insight from it and then feeding them with content and advertorial that fits their behavior 
this way when people see these adverts when people see your content they do no longer feel like this is interrupting me because the advert is contextual or it's very relevant to them right a very good example is like the youtube ads that you skip over five seconds right people the advertisers take their time to do a very good targeting understand what kind of content you consume on youtube your previous browsing history target this as you and also give you the option to skip after five seconds so when you actually do not skip it means that you actually like the ad and it's contextual to you based on what they have understood about your previous behavior on the internet right um so when it comes to targeted adverts that's when you talk about behavior advertising the other third type of marketing is permission marketing Permission marketing is about opt-in and opt-out. Think about it. A very good example is email marketing. So when you actually sign up for a newsletter in for any brand at all, um, they give you the option to opt-in, right? And then whenever they skip sending you email, email newsletters, they, that's as a result of you already giving them the permission to do that because you've dropped your data previously. Or when you go on the line, if a, 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 a go, go on a website, right? You see a campaign, you like the ad, but you go on the website, and before you download an ebook or you download a song or buy something, you leave your email address to them or you sign up on a website. That's you leaving your details. And so, based on that, you're giving them the permission to keep sending other messages to you, right? So, what I just talked about is interruption marketing basically just pushing your stuff think about like traditional marketing or materials where they don't target you very well or pop-up forms and then behavioral based on really good targeting when you understand your behaviors when you understand what you like on the internet when you understand your past browsing history and then saving you ads that is very contextual to your interest right i think about it all behavior marketing like google search also when you go online and you search for a keyword the only adverts that you see are things that are very contextual to what your search query was about right that's a very good example of behavior marketing you're not going to see ads or google search results that are not contextual or are not relevant to exactly what you searched for on google and in permission marketing, a good example is email marketing. You opt in in landing pages and when you're signing up for stuff and they, they are able to keep sending you messages, advertorials, promotions, content, based on the fact that you already gave them permission to use your data to keep marketing to you. Does that make sense? Awesome. Um, let's move further. The next thing I want to talk about is types of media. Now, we have owned media, we have paid media, and we have end media. Uh, owned media is content that you are fully in control of. Think about content of a company like your company website, your blog, and your social media account. Things that you have control of. You open them, you build them, you design them, and you have full admin access to control the kind of content that goes in and kind of interaction that actually goes on on that page. That's our own media. Another type is paid media. Paid media is paid to drive traffic, conversion, and lead generation to own media properties. So, own media is the platforms that you have. Paid media is the process of you paying to drive engagement, right? You use Google search ads, you use um, video advertising, banner advertising, use all the different paid media or paid channels to drive traffic back to your own media channel, which could be your social media account, which could be your company blog, which could be your company website. But then end media, which is the one kind of media that brands need to actively try to acquire in large number is there is media that you get as a result of your exposure media that you earn as a result of what you're doing so far media that you get through word of mouth think about it like shares reposts reviews recommendation press mentions things that you people it's like user generated content based on what you shared on your own media platforms based on content that you put out there using paid media you get end media as a result of how good or how controversial sometimes that your content has been right a lot of us have own media a lot of brands a lot of businesses have own media and um, brands that have advertising budgets go ahead to use paid media but not everybody is able to acquire end media right so as a digital marketer that you want to be a presume that's why you're watching this video it's very important that whenever you're doing any form of digital marketing whether you're paying for it or you're going the organic route you have to always think about would this thing generate end media would i get people to share would i get people to repost would i get people to comment would i get blogs to pick it up for my instagram or twitter page would i get people to give recommendations give reviews that is end media that's what gives you virality that's what builds your brand equity and that's what also helps to increase or enhance your brand perception okay so like i said own media we have websites mobile site blogs shared content 
paid media social media adverts paid search display ad and of course paid influencers so boom the paid influencers are usually on social media they are part of N media because they are paying them to actually drive people to engage with your brand and the end media of course shares reviews mentions and reposts all right let's talk about digital brand um, digital marketing at the end of the day, it's or marketing at the end of the day, it's about enhancing your brand perception. It's about getting people to know about your brand and getting them to love your brand enough to actually be, become customers, paying customers, and also people who are brand advocates that is telling other people to come use your product or use your services. Now, when you're building your digital brand, it's very important that you don't just think about your content as an abstract term. It's important that you think about it in the grand scheme of things. And two very important aspects of thinking about your digital brand is one, your digital voice, and then your digital footprint. Your digital voice is the core of everything. It's as a result of what you constantly communicate, right? And how you communicate it and when you communicate it. Your voice is built over time. It's, it's, it's something that, it's not just something that people get to understand in one day it's something that over time people say okay this is this brand voice a result of what they are communicating how they are communicating it and when they are communicating it so as a digital marketer when you're working with a brand don't think about your content in isolation don't think about the media you're using in isolation think about how this content how this advertorial how this creative how this thing these strategies will affect your brand perception how it will affect your brand voice right and it has to be consistent in building your brand voice you need to build consistency over time understand the kind of brand you're working with is it a b2b brand is it a business to business brand is it a b2c brand is it like a business to consumer brand is it a corporate brand what are their products what are their services who are their target audience how do their target audience like to be spoken to what are their needs Understand these things and use it to influence the kind of content that you put out there, how you put out the content, and at what time you put out the content. Of course, what channels. All these things, communication is what makes your brand voice and is what largely affects your digital brand. If you get your branding wrong, your marketing cannot produce results because it is a brand that you're actually promoting. And of course, the second thing is your digital footprint. Your digital footprint is a result of everything that you have done from the beginning of that brand as it as it pertains to the internet all their social media all their web usage and so once you come in once the first time you come across a brand or you're about to work with a brand first of all go and do an audit understand what kind of things have you putting out there before understand if there are negative sentiments if there are positive sentiments trace their footprints from the very first thing they're putting together understand how they progress over time what people have been saying over time people's perception over time and then use that to continue in building your your your, your digital voice so yeah digital voice and footprints can be very similar but voice is really about what you're communicating your footprint is every other thing right that's where your social listing comes into that's where your search engine optimization can come into everything that you have on the web every presence you have on the web they all come together to make your digital footprint and they're all important or each and every factor all right now let's go to part two which is traditional and digital marketing um we're going to talk about the differences between traditional and digital marketing let's talk about channels and activities for traditional marketing different channels that we have include tv tv ads um print ads so newspapers magazines anything that's printed flyers outdoor display like billboards you see on the street like if you're in lagos the billboard you see lucky phase one or in keja and um, radio ads so you're listening to a radio and there's a show going on and you hear some jingles playing between the musicals or the show itself those are part of traditional marketing and of course mailed print so there are some magazines that you have to subscribe for and they send it to you physical copies right like maybe how about harvard business review those are mailed prints and those are all aspects of traditional marketing basically every form of market including what amount every form of marketing that you do that do not need access to the internet or electronic devices all about trying um, digital marketing examples of channels and activities for digital marketing include paid search so paid search, the app, when you search for something on Google and you see ads show up, search engine optimization, content marketing on your blog, social media, email marketing, lead generation. So you, put, you do a campaign on your website, people fill their data on your um, sign-up forms. 
conversion optimization ensure that even when people convert they download they buy something they sign up for something that you keep optimizing the process so that you can keep retaining them and you can actually get better results for cheaper analytics so understanding your web analytics understanding your social media analytics um, automation how do you automate all your processes across all your digital activities and of course the one that everybody knows about social media marketing um, what are the key characteristics of marketing first one is media media is the way mm, the, the way media is consumed basically the way content is consumed by people by your audience that's media um then how engaged your audience is right what's the level of investment that people commit when they're consuming content in a particular medium and then the development of a message to a broader or niche audience and then the strategy of acquiring audience attention via push or pull tactics. So these are the four criteria they are going to use to differentiate between traditional and digital marketing. There's the mass and individual media, the way people consume media, there's passive and passive and engaged audiences, the level of investment of commitments to people when they consume media via a particular medium. There's one-to-one -one or one-to-many, the development of a message to a broader or niche audience, and there's outbound and inbound. That's the strategy of acquiring audience attention via push or pull content tactics. All right. Now, so now, now I have explained the four different things we're going to use to actually um, differentiate between traditional and digital marketing, which actually goes for which. For traditional marketing, the media is mass media. All this means is that people consume media in mass model, right? So when you see a billboard, for instance, there are thousands of people or hundreds of people that pass through that same lane every day. And so you have a lot of people who are consuming that, uh, that, that content and you can't target it. So what you're doing is looking at the volume of people that you can reach, but not how, no, but not how contextual or how relevant that, that content will be to them. So when I see something on like if it's one billboard, for instance, it might not be relevant to me, because, but there's a lot of people seeing it. There's a lot of masses seeing it. But it comes with digital marketing, it's more of an individual media. Because even though we're using the same channels, everybody's on social media, everybody's on YouTube, everybody's on search. These are mass channels, but everybody relates on these channels are based on their own individualistic personalities, based on their own individual interests and behaviors. So you can actually target and which people based on their particular pain points because everybody consumes this based on from a really really personal level right so traditional marketing is mass media you are reaching a large volume of people but not reaching their pain point because you can't really target their behaviors and interests but digital marketing is individual because even though you're reaching them using mass channels you can target their behaviors understand their interests understand their browsing history I give them content that is contextual to them and content that they really like, right? And then the next thing is how the level of engagement. Traditional media marketing is very passive. Audiences consume content in a very passive way. What it means that the, the level of investment or commitment that they give to the medium that they consume content is not as active as it will be when you're using digital platforms. Take for example, when you're watching TV. Right, you're probably watching a show on TV on DSTV, and then an advert comes in, and the next thing you go to your mobile phone because that gets you engaged. At other times, you can be watching a TV program and you're having conversations with like five other people in the same room, or you're listening to a radio on your way back, but you're also thinking about how, making sure that the conductor doesn't, you know, um, forget your change. Right? It's very passive. You see a flyer, somebody gives you a flyer, and the next thing you're squeezing it and throwing it down there. It's a large volume of people you're reaching but they are not as engaged. Also, they can't even ask you questions. For instance, if you give somebody a flyer, and say you print 10,000 flyers, and you give out 10,000 flyers, and if people have questions about that particular flyer, nobody can actually ask you questions. It is not a two-way conversation. It's just about, okay, I've seen it. I may or may not call the number for inquiries. Almost nobody calls for inquiries, and they just keep moving. I could see a billboard. Yeah, it looks nice, but I can't actually engage. I can't ask questions. I can't give them my feedback. Right? It is very passive medium of advertising, but digital is very engaged. For instance, let's talk about YouTube. When you see ads that say skip after five seconds, that gives you the authority, the control over whether you want to engage on that content or not. Right? So when you don't skip, you're committing yourself to say, I want to watch this. Right? When you see content on, on a blog and you take your time reading it, you are aware that you are spending a lot of time and 
and and data but you are more engaged because you're most times you're using it on your mobile phone and you're always looking at your mobile phone and of course there's a conversation that can actually go on you can actually comment on your post on social media you can send dms you could email asking them questions and be sure that you get a reply back you could share and ask your friends what they think about it there's a lot of engagement and conversations that can go on on digital media but cannot go on when it comes to traditional and of course um the development of message now, traditional media is largely one-to-many, but digital is one-to-one. -one. And this, again, goes back to your target audience and how you interact with them. Um, I'm an advertiser on traditional media, and I'm sending my message to a large volume of people. That's it, right? It's a broad audience. I cannot, I cannot, um, target, the, I cannot target as well on traditional as I can on digital. If I'm putting a, an ad on an Ebola Live TV channel for Restant, I can't tell the age of people who are going to be sitting down watching that or content when it comes up i can't tell what their interests are i might not be able to tell what the location they are. are they in lagos are they in potakot are they in kaduna i can't target those things right it's a really broad audience same thing on radio i could do it maybe like kind of location targeting on radio because i'm in lagos i want to target to sound city fm i'm in benin i want to target to vibes fm but that's the best i can do i can't target their age, I can't say their interest. It's usually a very broad audience. So it's you, the advertiser, just send your message to as many people as possible in the hopes that they will get it and they will like it. But then digital on the other hand is one-to-one, -one, right? Because it is an advertiser talking to you an individual in a mass channel like social media, but because I'm targeting, I'm giving you a message as contextual, I'm also personalizing the message. For instance, email marketing, you get e thousands of emails from different um, brands, maybe like Jumia Conga, especially e-commerce firms, and they send your email and they go, dear peace, or dear dial, or dear Taiwo. It's not like they really know who you are, but they can personalize these things to you and make you feel like this is an individual talking to an indi another individual. When it comes to digital, brands can actually humanize themselves and make you feel like you're actually speaking to somebody who's just another person just like you. And then inbound versus outbound marketing. That is the strategy of acquiring audience. For inbound, for digital marketing, you can do an inbound concept where you just pull them using content. You can also do outbound, which is just advertising to them. But for traditional, you're yeah, stuck to just outbound, making sure that I just want to push on my content. I can't draw them in. I can't engage with them. So you're just pushing out your content to them in hopes that they will get it, right? You're pushing out, but for digital, you have the option to pull or to push. So you can do inbound, you can do outbound for digital, but for traditional, you're stuck to just the outbound. Now let's talk about the relationship between traditional and digital marketing. Right? Even though these two concepts or these two kinds of marketing are largely different, even though they differ very well, they can still actually work together. They still have a relationship. They can actually use two, both of them for marketing campaigns in what we call integrated marketing. For instance, a user can actually see an ad on TV and like the brand enough to go on search, search for the brand, go to their website. It started from TV ad, but then they went on search. Then they got to the website, saw that they had social media accounts, looked at the social media, found out that, okay, they're launching an offline store very soon somewhere in two days time. And then when it comes to that launch date, they make a mental note, go to the store, back to traditional, buy something, realize that, oh, okay, they're doing an Insta story and they can feature and do interviews and they get your brand using their Insta story or live videos. That relationship started from TV to search to website to social media back to offline stuff for like a launch of like an event and then back to social media right so you can see that there's actually a relationship brands do this all the time you see an ad on a billboard for instance right a brand is launching and they tell you that okay there's an event and you go for the live event out during the event they give you um their social media handles that tell you to engage with them on youtube tell you to engage with them on instagram it started from traditional progress to a life then the next thing you're going back to social media now the idea of this relationship is for you as a digital marketer or a digital marketing want to be to understand that there's goal is going to be a relationship and you have to leverage on this relationship this traditional marketing is never going to go away right it's just digital marketing is growing yes but i don't think you would ever kill traditional marketing they will always find a way to work together hand in hand it is your job as a digital marketer to find the best way to make it work for your brand think about ideas think about strategies on how you could start a journey on digital and take it offline 
or start a journey offline and take it online. It all depends on you. Understanding your customer's journey, understanding what they want, and understanding how you can integrate both of them together. Now, I just mentioned something about buyer's journey. You're probably wondering what is the buyer's journey. That's the next part we're going to. On this part three, we're going to be talking about what the buyer's journey is, the different stages of the buyer's journey, mental models of marketing, micro moment, and then digital activities and how they relate back to the buyer's journey. Let's go. All right, so what is the buyer's journey? The buyer's journey is the process a buyer goes through to become aware of, evaluate, and purchase new product or services. In other words, each buyer advances through a stage of research and decision process, ultimately culminating in a purchase. In simple terms, before you buy something, there was a process you're going through, right? And that process has five stages. The first one is the awareness stage. The awareness stage is when consumers discover how your product may solve a problem that you have. So for instance, when you realize that, oh, I just want advert and I actually have that problem. For instance, I need an energy drink and I see a monster advert for instance. I just became aware that that product can actually solve my problem. Or you realize that you have a need or you don't even have a problem, but you just became aware of a brand for the first time. That's the awareness stage, right? So awareness is either you become aware that this product can solve a problem you have or you become aware that you have a problem that you need a product to solve or you just become aware of the product but the problem is the, but the point is there's awareness in that stage the second stage is interest stage interest trade is when consumers become more familiar with the product or service and they're just looking at the offer so you know when you see a, an ad for the first time and you're like okay yeah and then you sit again and that time you're like okay maybe i can consider using this thing you're not sure but you're just exploring your options consuming more of their content just looking at that's when you just become interested right and then third stage is the consideration stage consideration stage is when consumers is ready to know more about the product and make comparative investigations this is largely the most important stage in the buyer's journey because at the point when a, a, a particular audience or consumer has moved from the awareness stage to the consideration stage at that point they are comparing they're comparing your brand against other brands. They're comparing this product against other products. They're trying to find the best offer for them. They're comparing prices. They're comparing, checking out reviews to know if this brand is good. They're checking if this brand actually meets their needs, right? It is very important at this stage that your brand has enough content to feed their decision-making process. For instance, if I need an energy drink right now, I'm going to be comparing Monster, Red Bull, Powerhouse, and the rest of them. I need to be able to find information about these three brands to find out, to actually decide which one to pick, right? So a consideration stage is all about comparative investigations. I have a problem or I have a need, which products do I buy? Which brands do I go for? I need to open a mutual fund account. Do I go for ARM or do I go for Stambic or do I go for Wema Bank? I have to be able to decide. But to actually make that decision, I need to be fed with a lot of information about the different brands. So the question is, if you are working for a brand at the moment, does your brand have enough content to convince a user when they get to the consideration stage for your user, for that user to pick them over the other competitors or over the other alternatives? The fourth stage of the buyer's journey is the conversion stage. The conversion stage is the user has made their decision, right? The customer is ready to buy and convert their decision into a purchase. So I've compared, I realized, okay, I want to actually use this product. I want to go for this brand. I want to go for this service. Um, it's very important at this stage that you, the consumer knows exactly what to do. And this is where call to action comes in, CTAs. Um, it, some brands are really good at putting that information out there, telling them why you should pick me after them. But when the consumer finally makes that decision, they can't find how to do it. They can't find their content info. No phone number, no email address, no customer care service, no website, no physical address. There's no information to actually get me to do, right? So it's not just important for you to give them information that convinces them. It is also important that at the point where they're ready to convert, there's a very seamless process in place for the user to actually make their purchase, right? If I go to your website, I don't want to have to go through a hundred pages before I finally find the cart page or the checkout page i want to see a product buy a product place my order and next time i'm getting an email that my product is being shipped it has to be a very seamless conversion process right so when you go to the conversion state think about it how do i make this purchase how do i make this sign up how do i make this download process as seamless and simple and easy and short as possible 
for my user, right? Can they see the CTA, right? Is the CTA very glaring? Is it very vivid? Is it very convincing? Is it something they can easily see, right? Are my content info available for them to see? And then the retention stage. Retention is also a very important stage, right? Consideration is very important. Retention is also very important. Retention is you being able to build consumer and brand relationship. So getting people to not just convert, but for them to become repeated customers, right? So consumer and brand will build a strong relationship as the product exceeds the consumer's expectation. For you to retain customers, you have to meet their expectation, but you also have to give them a very good experience, right? Businesses will not grow except you actually give customers a good experience and meet their expectations, right? You can't scale a business if you just keep getting new customers all the time. You need to have retainers, people who come back all the time, people who can become brand advocates so that even when they've used you, they can go and tell somebody else that this product is good or this brand is good or this brand, this service is good, you come and use them again. That's the cause of your business. So as a digital marketer, your job doesn't end in promotion, getting people to know about your business. It doesn't end in getting people to convert, getting them to sign up, to buy, to call in. No, your job ends when you can create a retention process that makes people convert but also become loyal customers and brand advocates. You can do this via email marketing, social media, but there has to be a retention strategy in place for every campaign that you have to do. Now, I'm still talking about the buyer's journey. There's something that was called the mental model of marketing. Think about, say, 5, 10, 15 years ago, if you're old enough. Um, there was a process at which people buy stuff, right? It was called the mental model, and it has three stages. The stimulus, the first moment of truth, and the second moment of truth. The stimulus is the awareness or the, an interest stage where people get aware that they want this thing, they want this product, they want the service, and they're interested in looking for it. And once they get that stimulus, the next thing they do is to get to the store, right? And then go and actually buy it. And then after they get there, that becomes their first moment of truth. So, for instance, I could see a shoe that my colleague wore to work. I'm like, hey, Dio, I like your shoe. And he goes, okay, that's cool. Do, um, where did you buy the shoe from? He tells me, do they have my size? He says, yes, that's my stimulus. The first moment of truth becomes when I get to the store, meet the customers there, see how they respond to me, and they give me the shoe. I check it out. The price is okay. It looks nice. Then I say, okay, I want to buy. The second moment of truth becomes when I eventually experience that product. So the first time I want to wake up in the morning, get to work, and say, no, I'm going to buy this shoe today that I saw from Dio. And then sometimes you realize that, oh my God, this store is torn. You didn't see it at the store, but you realize at that moment that it's torn and you can't do anything about it. That was the former marketing model. Stimulus, first moment of truth when you get to the shelf or when you get to the store. Second moment of truth when you experience it. I remember a very funny story I heard one time. I grew up in Benin City, Nigeria, and there's a market that we call Ring Road, right? And somebody used to say, when you go to market and you want to buy stuff, and then you usually have to go inside the stores, right? And you have like colored lights, like green, red lights. So when you actually buy like a piece of clothing, you could actually sit in the store and it looks, say, red because of the lights. But then you get home or you get outside the market and you bring it out from your bag and realize, oh my God, this shirt is actually black or it's actually blue, right? That becomes the second moment of truth. But the problem becomes, do I have to now start going back to that same shop? To actually go and purchase that product to go and report, right? It was very it, it was a very cumbersome mental model, it's a very cumbersome um, buyer's journey, right? But now there's a new mental model. And the new mental model has something we call Zimot. Now the new marketing model has something called Zimot. That is a zero moment of truth, right? So there's now the stimulus, that's the awareness and interest phase. But before there's the first moment of truth where you get to the store to buy, there's what we call the zero moment of truth. That is the consideration stage that we are in. That's the pre-shopping experience. So before I buy something, now what do you do? You think about where you can buy it. For instance, I want to buy a phone. The first thing I would do is not to walk into a slot shop. The first thing I would do would be go online and I'll check prices. I'll check reviews. Check go on YouTube and look at tech bloggers and see what they think about this phone. Check the camera quality. I'll say, okay, maybe I should buy from Jimmy or Conga, but I'll compare delivery time, flexibility, pricing, discount. There's a whole lot of things that go into it. When I eventually see a buyer, maybe like, or rather a seller, an online seller, I have to check, okay, maybe on social media, how many followers do they have? What are the amounts of comments they have? What kind of comments? What kind of people? What, are, what things are people saying? That's a zero moment of truth. And zero moment of truth for every user is as a result 
of somebody else's second moment of truth. So when I finish considering and then I go to the swan convert and then the brand is good enough to retain me, I have to I end up going online to leave my reviews, to leave my comments. Those things I put online about the brand become somebody else's real moment of truth. And so this is why retention phase is also very important as well as consideration. For retention, you need to give your customers good experience because their experience would be another person's real moment of truth. That would be their consideration decision. It is not just about your brand, putting out content that people like, putting out content that people find relevant. It's also about the user-generated content surrounding your brand. And that user-generated content is a result of people's retention phase, people's experience and expectations. Did you meet the expectations? What did they experience when they use your brand, your product, or your service? These two things, retention phase and consideration phase, are the most important. And as you can see from the slide, they are very aligned. They, are, they actually work together. They are very related, right? So work on your stimulus. Get people aware of your product. Get them interested. But ensure that your consideration phase, which is going to be somebody's zero moment of truth, is going to be their deciding factor whether they'll pick your brand or not is in place. But also remember, it comes as a result of someone else's retention phase, the experience of your brand. What, what reviews they left, what comments they made, and what they thought or said about your brand. All right. Now, another concept I want to talk about for the buyer's journey is what we call micro moments. Now, um, micro moments are the four game changing moments that really, really matter to brand and that really, really matter to consumers. In these moments, customers want what they want, when they want it, and are drawn to brands that deliver on those needs. And there are four. The first one is their want to know moment. When someone is exploring or researching, but it's not necessarily in the purchase mode. So people are checking for how to do this, how to cook a goosey soup, how to how to not a tie, right? These are want to know moments. And they tend to go towards brand for the long haul, brands that actually give them answers to the questions that they ask when they're searching for things on YouTube or Google. The next thing is I want to go moment. When someone is looking for a local business or is considering buying a product at a nearby store, right? I want to go moment. I want to go to this place. I want to go to this restaurant. I want to go for travel. I want to go and buy something at a nearby store. People are looking for things around them and things that make their journey, their traveling process, or their going process a lot easier. Customers at this stage or at this moment will always tip towards brands who they can find on their maps. If I want to eat something right now, I'm going to go to the nearest restaurant close to me. If I want to, if I, if I'm at Tsurulere and something happens to my shoe, I'm going to start searching for shoemakers around, right? If I want to use a bank, I'm going to look for the nearest ATM. It's all about how you can be a king in your local, in, in your local area. How you can be a king in the place where you are and how you can give people information they need to make their travel processes or their going processes a lot easier. The next thing I want to do moment, when somebody wants to do something, do a tax or try something new. So when I want to re check how, how to flash my phone, I want to check how to um, do a presentation on slide, I use my phone to control it. This is I want to do moment, right? I'm also asking questions, but it's largely about technical skills and actually doing something or completing a new tax. I would always tilt towards brands that would give me the answers or towards tough leaders who would actually give me the answers I need to quickly have what I want to do get done. And the fourth moment is the I want to buy moment. When somebody is in purchase mode, they're ready to buy something. The question is, how easy would you make it for them? How easy is the conversion process? How easy can they find the prices? How easy can they find the contact information to actually buy stuff? So I want to know, I want to do, I want to go, and I want to buy. How can you as a digital marketer or as a brand actually you leverage on these moments to ensure that you are there and you're the go-to brand for your consumers. Three tips. First one, be there. Anticipate micro moments for your target audience and commit to being there to help them when those moments occur. So think about the things that people will be looking for, the kind of content that they want when they're in their want to know moment, when they're there in their want to do moment. Think about, anticipate these moments, anticipate it, and then create content that can feed them information or meet their needs. Be useful. Provide a digital experience that's relevant to consumers in needs of, at the moment and quickly connect people to the answers they're looking for, right? So be there, be present, be accountable. Create a seamless consumer experience across all screens and across all channels 
and measure the collective impact across them. Understand this, that this digital marketing world we are new is a world of multi-screen and multi-channel. Every, almost every internet user has access to multiple screens. You have a laptop, you have a smartphone, you also have an iPad. Right? A lot of people have multiple screens that they're using to leverage on the internet. But it's also the multiple channels. So people are on different social media um, handles. So there's social, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's display, reading blogs, YouTube. There are so many channels you can use to reach your consumers. And so you need to be accountable. You should be able to create a consistent experience across all screens and across all channels. Don't be a brand that is awesome on Instagram. But when your consumers go on Twitter, they are finding a brand that's completely different from what they're familiar with on Instagram. Don't be a brand that on a laptop screen, your website loads beautifully, but on a mobile phone, people can't see anything. It's not navigable. They have to pinch in and pinch out, right? You have to be able to create a, co a consistent, seamless experience across all screens and across all channels. So be there, be present, be useful, and be accountable. <coughs> Now let's talk about digital activities and the buyer's journey. So we have, of course, the awareness stage, the interest stage, the consideration stage, and the conversion stage and the retention stage. Example of channels that you could use for these different stages are for interest and awareness stage, because they usually go hand in hand. We have content marketing, we have display and video advertising, and we have social media marketing. For consideration and conversion stage, we have PPC search, that's paid search, pay-per-click advertising, and search engine optimization. For retention, we have email marketing, automation, and analytics. Let me explain. The reason why content marketing, display advertising, and social media is very important for the awareness and interest stage is because these are the different platforms that people get exposed to your brand for the first time. If I read a blog, it exposes me to what knowledge you have to give me. When I go on social media, when I go on YouTube, I see your brand for the first time, I see a video for the first time, it exposes me for the first time to your brand and probably spikes my interest in your brand on your product or your service. When I'm on a low super girl and I see your adverts, then I get exposed to your brand. So content marketing, video and display advertising, social media are good for awareness and interest fees. Consideration and conversion, people so search, search engine marketing as a whole is very important, right? Because at that consideration and conversion stage, people are searching for things. They are trying to find out they're in the active mode of, they're in the purchasing mode. They need that information now and they're ready to convert. That's the headspace they are. That's what they're thinking about at that moment. In awareness stage for video social media, people go online for their own selfish purposes. But when they go on search, it is for something that they actually want at this moment, right? So brands must be able to use search to hit their customers right there and there and get them to convert easily because they're already thinking about your product or service, right? So you can use PPC search, right? So pay to, pay to Google to place your ads on Google search results or you can optimize your web page. So when people search, you can actually show up organically. And then for retention, we have email marketing. Email marketing is a very good way to get people to engage with your brand after they made purchase. You can send them tips, you can send them giveaways, you can send them thank you messages directly to their email box. Automating the process for them also would also help the process of retention. We're marketing to them and using your analytics to understand their insights, understand their behavior, and give them a better optimized process would also help in retaining your customers. Um, let me give real life examples. Things that can happen in awareness and interest phase are, for instance, I could read an article about event planning. I could go on Google and actually search on how to plan a cheap event or a cheap wedding in Lagos. I could also find a blog that talks about wedding grades. For instance, I'm a user and I'm in the headspace of planning an event for a friend or planning a wedding or my sister is about to get married and I want to talk, help her plan a wedding. So I can either read a blog about it, I can read articles about event planning. I could also search for Google and see how to plan a cheap wedding in Lagos. And then I see Google search results and I see blogs or videos that have this content, I go on them and I read it. And the very first thing that happens is that I'm not just getting information, but I'm also becoming aware of that brand that created that video or that article. And then for consideration and conversion stage, I could say, okay, um, I've read about a brand from my favorite blogger. Then I go online to search for the company and check their Google My Business reviews, check their website reviews, see what people are saying about the brand on search, see how their website looks like just from searching for the URL. I could also check their Instagram page for pictures of past events, see what they've done before. 
I could also find a current deal on their website and then say, okay, there's a 20% deal going on. It's a Valentine period. And so let me actually make contact with them. These things happen from searching, go to their website, see reviews going on Instagram, come back to the website, find a deal and say, okay, I want to make contact. And then for retention, when I finished planning the wedding, I found a wedding planner for instance. Um, from that blog that started the whole journey of telling me how to plan events, they can start sending me tips, maybe honeymoon tips. Right now you finish your wedding, these are ways to actually spice up your honeymoon, these are tips for newly wedded couples, these are tips on how to plan further events, birthday parties, one year birthdays. You could also follow up with um, updates and inspirational content on social media, just keeping me engaged to make sure that I still remember that this brand exists. Now that's the buyer's journey, right? We talked about the different stages, awareness, interest, consideration, conversion and retention. We talked about mental model, where there's now the Z-Mont model, the zero moment of truth. We talked about micro moments, the four micro moments. We also say align some digital activities to the buyer's journey. Next up, we're going to talk about marketing functions, right? Different marketing functions, how they relate to your buyer's journey. I would also talk about 360 campaign. All right, now let's talk about marketing functions. There are five different marketing functions, planning, awareness, conversion, retention, analysis, and optimization. What is planning? In planning, you're basically doing a lot of planning, right? Analyzing your business needs, doing research, business research, industry research, competitor research, um, target audience research. You're developing your communication objectives, your marketing objectives, your business objectives. You're setting goals, you're setting deadlines, and you're communicating this planning to every member of your team that will be involved in the campaign. Of course, you're setting your budget. Um, for the awareness stage, you're saying, okay, we've done the planning. What we're going to do is now think about how we're going to get people to be aware of our product right so you're going to identify different market opportunities develop and test different creative concepts because it's ideal that when you're doing digital marketing you don't stick to just one creative or one concept reason is because there's so many people on the internet and everybody has their own interest they need to be able to you need to give people different options for them to actually fall in love with your brand right think about coke for instance coke is a brand that has been there for years but every two months they release a new advert that wants that tends to go viral. It's not because people are not really aware of their products, because they're always trying to bring out new concepts and new ideas that can get maybe somebody that who, who is in love with Mirinda or Fanta to fall in love with Coke, right? So you have to be able to develop and test different creative concepts. Create your media strategy. So the different media channels, um, own paid end media, how, what strategies are going to use to achieve this and to promote this. Set your body, get approval from your team leader, from your boss. Now focus on developing content on image, audio, video content that will actually attract people and pull them into your brand. And then of course, when it comes to awareness, tips, leverage on events, leverage on PR, public relations, leverage on influencers, leverage on boards, leverage on trending news, and then leverage on really good branding format. Your brand, when it comes to awareness, your brand has to be spectacular because that is the first impression people get. They need to be able to fall in love with your brand, right? So test different formats. Influencer marketing, event marketing, PRO, boss, training topics are things you want to pay attention to when you're talking about awareness. Now, conversion. Of course, identify media opportunities again. You have to identify opportunities all through. Set quantitative goals and align them with your business needs. So it's not just about getting people to know about your business anymore. That's awareness. The idea is how do I set goals that will actually get people to convert and will actually help me achieve my business bottom line. Understand this digital market is not just about making noise. It's not just about getting people to know about the product at the end of the day It has to tie down to your business ROI your return on investment it has to be a business bottom line that you're checking as your benchmark as your standard Right, so align your goals to meet these business objectives Then develop your offer and messaging. What are you going to be saying and how are you going to be saying it? What things or offers will you give people that will make them convert? Test and adjust your content to make sure that people actually not just get aware, but will actually get them to click or sign up. Leave it on paid search, social advertising, retargeting, and of course, email marketing too. For retention, identify your buyer's needs and expectations. Retention is all about meeting their needs and exceeding their expectations and giving them experience. So for you to do that, you need to make sure that you have identified their needs and expectations so you can meet them and surpass them. And give them a good experience develop a nurturing strategy when you acquire them what are the different steps or processes you're going to take to nurture these leads for them to become brand advocates right so develop a nurturing strategy exceed their expectations give them good experiences provide additional value 
develop a customer specific content go personalization right just don't give them or content that is targeted to them based on their behavior but personalize it to them call their names give giveaways give shout outs on social media develop consumer specific content and then monitor post sale activity when it comes to analytics for retention it's all about what they do after they have made a purchase and then for analysis and optimization gather marketing campaign performance data right so it doesn't end in retention it doesn't end in conversion the idea is you need to be able to analyze so that you can actually get better get your campaign results understand the data understand the insight and then find a way to actually use this data to improve your campaign so you can get more results and spend less right so analyze results for sources of failure pause on the performing campaigns when you see a campaign is not working very well pause it right it, work on it tweak it optimize it um, we produce successful campaigns when you find a template or a particular strategy or process that works for you then replicate that and then adapt new strategies based on previous testing and results now let's align the marketing functions to the buyer's journey for planning and optimization they're going to go on all the way you are going to always plan for every campaign whether it's an awareness focus campaign or a conversion focus campaign you're always going to be planning right you're also going to be working with your team you're also going to be doing research same thing for analysis and optimization from the beginning from the from day one of your campaign you have to start analyzing and optimizing it goes on but of course for awareness function it goes for awareness and interest for conversion it goes for consideration and conversion and then for retention it goes for retention but remember planning and analysis and optimization that means that we go on all the way through your campaign from the one to the end of the day um 360 marketing campaign now a 360 marketing campaign covers the entire buying circle where every marketing traditional and digital medium is utilized in an integrated and consistent marketing and branding strategy understand this it is about integrated and consistent marketing and branding strategy so this is campaign covers the entire buying circle from awareness down to retention not just covering the entire buying circle but it also utilizes integrated consistent marketing and branding in other words when you're thinking about running a 360 campaign you have to think about consistency and integration integration in the sense of how do i integrate all the different channels to work together how do I create a relationship between all of them so that whenever somebody goes from one channel to another channel or one screen to another screen, they don't lose that process. How do I save their data so that when they leave, use one, change one browser to another browser or one phone to another device or one channel to another channel, you can still continue that process seamlessly. There has to be an integrated strategy across the cycle, across the channels. Your branding and marketing has to be consistent. I need to be on social and see this campaign running and when i go on twitter it's the same thing when i go on when i go see a billboard when i'm driving it's the same thing when i'm on the website i'm seeing the same thing your branding your marketing has to be consistent a very good example i have is um the gt bank star 737 ash campaign right the first time i saw the advert it was on tv right so i saw the advert on tv on dstv it was like a six minutes video then i went on youtube the first time and i saw a six seconds format same jingle same song then i saw an, another time a one minute version on social media one minute version i remember also seeing a billboard of a still image from a scene of that same campaign what they're able to do was to reinforce their messaging consistently across all the channels it wasn't a different video on tv and then a different video on youtube it was the same video but they cascaded it and tweaked the format to fit individual channels but it was consistent right so when thinking about UCC marketing campaign, think about how you can integrate it, have a consistent relationship, and how your marketing and branding must be consistent across the buying cycle, across all channels. What are the benefits of a 360 marketing campaign? One, it covers the entire buying cycle. So you're not losing anybody at any stage of the buying process. Two, you use every point of contact, every touch point, every channel. Whether you're offline, they'll find a way to reach you. Whether they're online, you're going to find a way to reach them. It implements both traditional and digital marketing, then you optimize for scale and relevance, and then effectively you can manage your results across all the platforms. Now let's talk about digital channels. We're going to talk about different digital channels and convergence on mobile. Let's go on. Um, different digital channels, we've talked about this over and over again, but I'll just explain a bit 
about the different um, channels and the reason I'm not going to go fully into all of them is because there are other courses coming up that would give you full details about each and every of this course. This is just introduction. So we have email marketing, paid search, organic search, display advertising, content marketing, social media marketing. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about paid search. Paid search is simply driving interested audiences to your site using search queries and only paying when people click on your advert. When you go on Google and you put in a search query, one of the things you will see on the search result page is the first two results you will see, you see AD attached to them, that's an advert, that's a PPC ad. Now for those users or the advertiser, they only pay Google when you or anybody else click on that ad. So when you see the ad and don't click, you don't actually make payments. It is very good, it's a very good digital marketing channel because you know that the people that are coming to your website are people that are already thinking about what you have to offer them. Because when I search for something on Google, it means I'm already in need of that particular thing, right? So it is a very good way of, of driving interested, targeted audience, relevant audience who are already in the conversion stage of the buying process to your website and then only paying when you click. And then we have search engine optimization. Search engine optimization is the opposite of PPC search. Right, this is the increasing visibility and searchability of your online assets by optimizing your website to rank organi organically on search engines. What this means is that you don't have to always pay Google to be on the first page of Google. Sometimes you can actually optimize your web page a lot of times, all the time. You can actually optimize your web page to make it very good content wise. Your keywords are relevant, your meta tags are there in a way that Google can easily crawl, index, and then save. Your web page as results to people when they search on google search right so that's searching optimization working on your web website to make it optimized for google to be able to easily crawl it index it and then save it as results when people search on google or other search engines and we have display advertising display advertising is generating leads and traffic to a highly targeted audience by advertising them on blogs, website, and YouTube. So the banner ads you see on blogs and websites and the video ads you see on YouTube, this is a result of display advertising, generating leads and traffic to a highly targeted audience. Now, when it comes to search, you target based on keywords, what people are using to search. But when it's display, you are targeting based on their online behavior and their online interests. So it's always very, very targeted. And the content marketing, Increase your brand with content marketing. You can increase your brand personality and likability by creating, curating, pu and publishing highly relevant content. With content marketing, when you give people information consistent that is relevant to them, information that enlightens them, educates them, infor informs them, and entertains them, it increases your enhance. It enhances your brand personality and likability. It makes people like your brand. It makes them see you as the go-to person for information, for resources for product, for services, as a go-to brand to meet their needs when they are actually in need. And that's content marketing. We have email marketing. Email marketing is delivering content directly to the hand of the audience at the right time via their emails. Very simple. When you go to your promotion tab on Gmail, for instance, you see a lot of, you see a lot of um, newsletters sent to you. That's email marketing. Being able to have people's data, They've given you permission to use their data and you send them to get their information that you can personalize directly to their email boxes. And then we have website optimization, providing a better user experience by getting better site authority. That's basically working on your user interface and user design to ensure that people actually like what they see when they go to your website. Make sure that your website is mobile responsive, it's navigable, people can easily see what they want to, what they're looking for and the conversion process is not too cumbersome on your website. And in social media, creating visibility and interactivity with your audience via social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, right? Social media helps you create engagement, get people to interact with you, getting a lot of people to know about your brand. And then mobile marketing, reaching a targeted audience on your mobile devices via websites, email, SMS, MMS, social media, and apps, right? So email marketing has, mobile marketing, sorry, has websites on it. Email marketing because people read your emails on your phone, social media because people access social media on your mobile phones, SMS marketing, MMS marketing, and of course apps. So the apps that you download on your Android phone or your iOS phones or your Windows phone, those apps have some level of advertisements that can get consumers to interact with their target audience. 
Now, mobile marketing is very important because mobile is disrupting the way people engage with brands. Ninety percent of internet users are accessing the internet using their mobile phones, right? So it's very important that you learn how to reach your users not just on laptops or computers, but targeted using their mobile phones. <clears throat> Now, there's something we call convergence in mobile marketing. Now, convergence is when device functionality begins to come together in one device. For instance, a smartphone now has MMS integration, SMS integration, has camera integration, so you don't need a digital camera anymore. Has music, you don't need a, um, a, a DJ or a speaker or a Walkman. Um, it has, of course, the phone integration. It has a browser integration. You don't need a laptop or an external device to browse. It has GPS, right? Location targeted. It has email. Mobile has been able to converge different function functionalities into one device. There's convergence of different functionalities on one place. That makes it a lot easier for brands to utilize these activities, these functionalities, and increase their engagement with their brand. So when you think about mobile marketing, ask yourself, how can I use the different device functionalities of a mobile phone? to enhance my campaign and get more people to use their mobile phones, their camera, their GPS, their email, their apps, their game apps, their productivity apps, their SMS integration, their maps. How can I get them to use the different functions of their mobile phone to interact with my brand and make my campaign a lot better? Now, the last thing we'll talk about today are tools, right? Tools on how you can actually conduct research. One of the things we talked about in planning was that you have to conduct research. You have to conduct industry research, company research, computer research, target audience research. How do you do this? There's something called market reality and there's something called market research. Market re research is simply finding out things about your consumers using the normal traditional methods like polls, questionnaires, history, focus group, and etc. But market reality uses the reality of the customers as it is now. It helps you start with the customer and work backwards. It is a better indicator of consumer needs and wants because you're using tools that gives you real life information, real life data about what your consumers think. Market reality tools examples are keyword research tools. When you use keyword planner, for instance, to search for what people are, or to find out what people are using the search of Google search, it gives you results as a now. And so you can use those same keywords and be able to get better results on your PPC search because they are a result of what your consumers are using to search for now. When you use social media listening tools like TweetDeck or um, social mentions or Google Alerts or Google Trends to find out what your consumers are currently talking about, weigh their interests over a period of time and find out what they're saying, negative sentiments or positive sentiments about your brand, you can easily use these trends or those trending topics or those listening analysis to effect changes in your brand right now, right? And they become more contextual and more relevant to your target audience. And then we have analytical tools like where Google Analytics, Kissmetrics, that give you insight on your website, how users are interacting with them, wh what pages they're looking at more often, what pages they're leaving, what their bounce rate is like, and it helps you improve your website so you can get more people engaged on your website and of course improve what um you're putting out there right so market research is good right doing polls doing questionnaires doing surveys focus groups looking at historical data is very good but it's more important to focus on market reality your listening tools your analytical tools and your research tools know what your customers are doing now what they like now and then use these things to work backwards and improve on your digital strategy now examples of market research we have survey monkey Google Forms and type forms. These are types of forms that you can use and you can you can go online with and create your own surveys or questionnaires and polls and send out there for people to feel what they think about it, what they think about your product, get their own data, just basically market research, right? Help with your survey and your questionnaires. For market reality tools, we have the listening tools like TweetDeck, Google Alerts, Google Trends, hashtags, Brand Watch, keyword research tools like Keyword Planner. Analytical tools like social media inbuilt analytics. So Facebook has insights, Twitter has Twitter analytics, LinkedIn has LinkedIn analytics. So every social media platform has their own analytical tools that are very important for you to understand what's going on in your social media pages. We have Google Analytics, we also have Kissmetrics. But for market research, we also have Inomoto, eMarketer, and Nelson. Now we're going to go on and do a practical section on how to use Google Forms how to use Google Trend and how to use Google Alerts, right? I'm going to show you guys how to practical 
use these tools and then when we're doing social media marketing in your social media course you learn how to use tweet deck and other social media listening tools let's go to the practical class thank you hello there my name is pc timmy we just concluded the theoretical section for introduction to digital marketing by wild fisher and digital center now i'm going to take you through the practicals now two aspects we're going to do practical for is the market research and market reality tools now i mentioned earlier that when you're trying to have an understanding of your audience or your competition or your market or your industry you can do two kinds of research the market research or the market reality and we established that market reality is the best form because you can have an idea of what's happening on with your audience at the moment right now and there are different tools you can use to do market reality research you could use google trends you could use google alert and social listening tools but for market research the tools are available you could use survey monkey you could use time form you could use google form in this practical section i will show you how to use google form i'll show you how to use google trends and i will also show you how to use google alert so let's go First of all, to use Google Forms, go to zux.google.com slash forms, as you can see on the screen, and then press enter. Now, to access Google Forms, aside going to the URL, you need to be logged into your Google account. As you can see here, I'm already logged into my Gmail account. If I wasn't, once I go to docs.google.com slash forms, it would give me a prompt to sign into my Gmail or my Google account, they're both the same thing. And you want to do that, it takes you to a screen just like this. Now, on Google Forms, there are different templates that you could use when you want to start instead of starting from scratch. And um, we have event feedback, order forms, job application, term request, customer feedback, contact information, etc. Right? You can choose any of this if this seems like what you want to set up a form for. Right now, I will just go back, I'll press this, and use a blank form to create my Google form. So I'm going to press blank. And once this comes out, it gives me the opportunity to set a title for my form and then a form description. So I could say, sample form for this marketing introduction class the description the form is created to show you conclusion Okay, now we're done. Now, different things you can do. I can start by typing a question, say name, and then once you use things like name or email addresses, it automatically changes to short answer. So I will leave it here. If for instance, I want to add an image, I can upload one here. And then to add an additional question, I would come and to this section and say add question. If I want to add an additional title, I would add this here. If I want to add an image or a video or add sections to my form, I'll do that here. First of all, let's add some prerequisite questions. So add question. And I can see the question here. And I'll add save email address. And I come here, short form is here already. And I'll make this a required question. What this means is that I'll go back to name required question what this means is that nobody can submit the form without filling any of these two questions there's some that you can make non required so when people are filling the form they can choose not to answer that particular one i'll come back here again and click add question screw down and click phone number again short text and make this required now come back again add question and say location and I want to make this say multiple choice question so I'll become multiple choice and then add my say Lagos Delta Abuja 
and I will make it required. Let me add another question which I would leave as let me say date of birth. Automatically it gives me date. So you could see that Google Form is very intuitive. When you put a detail for as a question, it automatically gives you the kind of answers that should be there. So for phone numbers, they give me short answers for dates, it's opened up as a date. So people can then answer in this sequence. I'll make it look around. I'm going to use a random question. Like say, what is digital marketing? And then I'll come to this and make it a paragraph so people can answer for as long as they want right now if i want to add much more information to this question i can click on these three dotted buttons here and show description description is telling them what that question is supposed to be so i said um explain digital marketing in words if i want the response validation I could add that here and so say minimum or maximum character limit. So I want people to answer the question with a minimum of 50 characters and say use more than 50 characters. So if people are answering this question and the answer is not up to 50 characters, it would actually show an error message which is this. Okay. I'll add another kind of question and this time I'll make it a drop down. What is your favorite food? And instead of a multiple choice, I would like to have a drop down menu. So I would add rice. Then shawarma. Okay, I will make this required also. If I want to just duplicate this particular question, I can just duplicate it here and change this to what is your favorite color? Red, blue, orange. Um, if I want to get people to upload the file, say for instance i just use a job application form and i won't be able to upload their series i could change this to file upload and then people would be would need to sign into their google so their email address has to be a google account and then they can insert it from their google drive okay so max i can set not maximum number of files maximum file size say 100 gigabyte um only a like specific kind of file so i'm saying resume and then i could say i want just pdfs or documents no video no spreadsheets no drawings no images so images could work people design their resumes in different formats and do this now that's how basically to have google form now, if I want to add some more things, like I want to differentiate this into different sections, I can add, click on section here. And so once people finish filling this, they'll see another section that says, um, contest. And then I can add much more questions, like what is CPC? make this required if i want to add an image here i could click on add an image and i could add an image using a url take a snapshot or for my google drive or i could upload so i would use by url so let me search for something on google so marketing welcome to images I'll click on this image. I'm just picking a random image right now. I'll click on copy image address. You can see that here. 
and I'll come back here and I'll paste the image, image address here and select and that's it an image has been added to that particular session if I want to add a video I could search for YouTube and say DIP testimonial Search so I can insert a testimonial from our DIP program and add it from YouTube. So if you want to upload add a video to your Google Form, you need to add it on YouTube first of all. Alright, and I can edit this and then I can come here and change the form. Okay, that's basically creating the form. Um, I could preview it from here. So let's preview and see how it looks. This is how it looks name, email address, phone number, location. And then people have to add their file. And when they do this and they click on next, it takes them to the second section where I uploaded the video and image. Alright. I'll come back here to and change the color theme and change it to red right so you can customize it i could also upload an image and use the image for my form say this within my team right if i want to use an image a custom image for myself i could upload my photos by myself all right and then the next thing will be to settings so i'm going to remove this so it doesn't restrict access to just people who are following world fusion digital center or people in the organization um, i could get co collect email addresses so people have to sign in as a requirement or i could leave it i just leave email addresses as a required question on the form and then respondents can if i click on this it means after submitting people can then edit their responses if i click on see somewhere and chat it means that whenever somebody submits their form they can also see the summary of other responses from other people so you could decide to use it as you wish all right and there are some cool things i could also add a show progress bar what this means is when people fill a form it will show them how many more questions they need to fill to get to the end of the form and then I could edit my response and say, thank you for filling this form. We will get back to you shortly. And I would say, all right, now I could send this form via email to somebody. I could copy the link, shorten it. And copy this link and share to people to fill the form or i could embed the link okay i can embed this form because i uploaded the file question if i remove the file question then i can embed it um so let's do that let me remove the file question there's a file question so i did uh, to remove i'll just click on delete now go back to send and i'll click on embed and so i can embed this form on any website on the internet and so people don't have to go to the URL, but instead they can easily just embed the form there. Now continue on Google Forms. If you want to change the color palette and you want to update your own, you can simply come to this. You can see it here. Click on this image icon and then you can upload your own photo from your own computer. Or you can as well choose from any of this listed here. 
I'll choose randomly. Then join my skills, my design skills. I'm just choosing randomly. And then go to settings. You could collect email addresses. So if you won't be able to sign in, not just to drop your email, just about to sign in, which means they'll be signing in with Google or the Google account with Gmail, then you click on this. Um, if you want to restrict it to just your organization, then it's when this will show up. If you want to limit it to just one response, it means people also have to sign in to Google too. If you, if you want people to be able to edit the form after they have submitted it, then you use this. If you want them to see summary of other people's responses after they have submitted the form, that's when you use see summary chat, text and responses. Usually, I just leave them unchecked because I don't want people to edit the form after they're done. Neither do I want them to see other people's responses. I mean, that's just me. Um, we could also show progress bar so people can see how far they've gone as they keep scrolling down the form. And when they fail, you can say this, you can edit this and say, Thanks for failing. You will hear from me shortly. You could also do this. You could also shuffle questions so that it's not arranged the way you have arranged it, but you can randomly just shuffle. If you're using it for like a test assessment, you want to do that so people don't tell each other out the questions and the answers, you know, exam tricks. And then you could also show link to a submit another response. So after you submitted that one, you want them to be able to still submit a new form or share that form link to other people. Then you can show them link to submit. Um, and that's it. And then you save. And then when you want to send your form, you come here. You could either just send it to someone's email directly. I'm going to use one of my email addresses, which is this. Or you could shorten the link and then just copy and paste this i'll put control c on this or you can embed it so other people can actually see the form and you so you can embed the form on your website without having to redirect them to google forms page you can just use this embedded code click copy and paste on your form this is like a html code that you upload on your website you could also share via google plus or share via facebook or share via twitter Right, I just copied the form from here. I'm going to click on copy, and then I'll close this, and then I'll go to incognito browser. And I will click in this. I'll paste it here so we can see how many who can see how it actually looks like in total. And then I'm gonna fill this form right now. So my name is Peace, my email address is peace at wdc.com.ng, phone number is 080-123-456-78, location, ladies, date of birth, 10 08 is a five. right, <laughs> what's digital marketing? See, this is what we, the 50 characters leave me coming to, so I have to find something to type. Uh -huh. Alright, what's my favorite food? This was a drop down menu. This also was a drop down menu. Do we see? And then I click on next takes me to the other option and I see the image and the video they're updated and then I click submit. Thank you for filling the form you will hear from me shortly. That's our form that we just created. I'll go back now. Click this. Now you can see on your form, once people fill the form, you can see all the responses and how many responses that you have. If there's so many responses, you'd see summary so summary will have everybody's name everybody's email address phone number by individual here we then show you the form one by one but we'll have just one response right now and then if you want to close the form so that people whenever people go to that particular link they can't access the form anymore you can close this and say the form is no longer accepting responses meaning that nobody can fill the form anymore so if i go back i've already checked this i will put incognito again I'm using incognito browser because I'm logged in on my normal browser or my normal window. And so if I 
open the form there it would show up like i'm the one created the form and what we want to do is to see the form like another user will see it on the internet right that's why i'm using cognito window so now we've seen that after we've um, closed or set the forms no longer accept responses this is what i'm saying that the form is no longer accepting responses um, so if you want to close your form you can always do that but then you can open them back and then people can see it um and then now if you want to take this to a spreadsheet so you could actually really analyze your data you can come here and click here when you go to responses you're in questions responses click on this and you can create a new spreadsheet and now click on create there's a really cool thing about google everything is synchronized and then i can come here so whenever people feel the way it automatically shows people's form responses on the form itself it would also automatically update on this so i could always see as many people's responses on my spreadsheet and I analyze copy as download as excel or pdf and you know do whatever i want to do with it okay um last thing for google forms is you could make a copy of this and just edit a little thing so make a copy duplicate the whole form and make a copy you can delete it you can add a preferred link so if you want to prefer the form so people have an idea of the responses they are supposed to put in there you could do this you could put the form as pdf and you could also add collaborators so if you want to add your team members or your friends to be able to edit the form and for them to also see responses you could click on this three button here and click on add collaborators and then you can add your email addresses so I can have my colleague say Binga on Alaja. And I can give him either edit access so he can do anything I can do on the form, he too can do it. Or yeah, I'll just give him edit access. And then I can add a message that says, Hi Binga. This is just a test. If not, please. And then send. That's it. Binga can now do whatever it is I can do to the part in the form. Okay. And if I want to remove him, I can come back to this mall, add collaborators, and remove him and save my changes. Alright, so that's Google Form. Thank you. Next up, we're going to work on Google Trends. So Google Trends is a market reality tool. Um, just go to trends. Google.com. Ng. Trends. Google.com. Ng. Okay. Now. We've gone to the trends google.com.ng. Um, Google Trends usually would allow you to check out trends in different countries. So you could come and see this drop down arrow here and you could see trends in every country. But the first thing you'd see when you come here is this dashboard explore what the world is currently searching. We either start by imputing a search term to get people's interest on that particular subject over time. Or you could also just come here and see okay so this is what these are examples Taylor Swift versus Kim Kardashian FIFA World Cup football and American this is just an idea of things you can compare from 2004 to like present day hour now once you go down from these examples you would see what's currently trending so Fino versus Wale one is trending right now today is June 7th and what's his nationalism is trending in Nigeria, Nigeria versus Czech Republic, Belgium, Belgium versus Egypt, June 12th is also trending, and that's because Buhari announced his money it's going to be our next democracy day. You could also see more trend searches, more trending topics. So this is what's trending today, June 7th. Uh, this is what's trending June 6th. This is what's trending June 5th. Right? It gives you like an overall idea of what's trending the last couple of days. Um, let's go back. To the home page we could also see previous things that's trended in previous years so we could see what trended in 2017 i will go back here 
and still also won training in 2016. In 2017, okay, um, these are the people that trended most. These are the events that trended. These are the movies that trended. These are the songs that trended. So if you're trying to remember what happened in 2017 and write an article or do a vlog or a podcast on things that trended in 2017, you could just come back to Google Trends and it will give you an idea of the things that when I enjoy, I talked about a lot in 2017. You could see countries too. You could check for all the countries too. Like, right, I could see what trended in, in uh, Ghana in 2017. Right, these are the things that trended in Ghana in 2017. Okay, um, let's go back to 2016. These are the things that trended in 2016. How to DJ party. How to stop auto renewal on Google, how to do an original iPhone X, etc. Right? So this is a, a general overview of things that trended in 17. And also, I can just come here, click on share, and share this thing, this whole dashboard of things that trended in 2016 to my Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Tumblr. Okay? Now close this tab and this. And I'll come back to 2018. Now I want to have an idea of what people are talking about, say, this is Nigeria, right? So we're going to talk about, yeah, let's, let's see, this is Nigeria, uh, as with this video recently. So let's see how the trend has progressed over the last couple of, of course, um, in the last one year, but recently since me i mean it started shooting up shooting up shooting up so may 27 to just democracy there i'm gonna be something more interesting like um can you miss and so i could gauge the interest of Kanye west over the last 12 months i could come here and use over the last 30 days right and this is the last 30 days is that the peak period for him right so 100 is like it was at its peak for that day and then 0 to 25 it's just really people conversations are not a lot on him for that period of that particular day i could search in different industries so i could streamline my search for that and just say i want to see what people are saying kind of rest in um Act and entertainment, right? Or let's see beauty and fitness. If we're going to see anything, beauty and fitness is quite different because he's in the entertainment industry, of course. So he's still going to be spoken so much in the beauty of fitness world. And then I could check for web search general, or I could check for image searches. So when you people make a search on um, Google and just click on image, what do they see? I could look for news, I could use for Google Shopping or YouTube search. So if people are searching for him a lot on YouTube, I click on YouTube. I'll go back here, click on Acts and Entertainment and see that this is what people are saying or this is interest of Kanye West on YouTube over the last 30 days. Okay, um, I can come down and see interest per soul region because again, I'm using .ng which is Nigeria. This is the interest of Kanye West in Nigeria sub-region. So it's really high in Anubra, then Ogun, then Oshun, Frederick Harbour Territory, and Rivers. And these are related topics, Pusha T. Okay, now I want to compare Kanye West to, say, a Beyonce or a Jay Z. Alright, I'm going to take this back to web search. I will leave it in Arts and Entertainment. And so I could see over the last 30 days, this is Jay-Z, this is Kanye West, and this is how much conversations people are having about them all over the web. This is how much people are searching for them on the web. Kanye West, in the last, oh, June 1st was 100. Jay-Z was just 13. Probably the day Kanye West released his new album, Yee. Okay, we can go back and see ways on regions. Right, who has Kanye West popular in Oyo and Cross River and Anubra 
Delta is Kanye, Jay-Z is Crossover, and Anna Bra and Oyo. And we can see Kanye is Delta. Um, they're kind of fighting in the room. And Kanye is also Nasarawa. Oh, sorry, I changed this by mistake. So let's go back to him there. Alright. So this is interesting over time for Dan. We could then see related query. So we could see a related query was kind of West New album. Jay Z is nothing just really about Jay Z all alone right now. Okay. Because if I want to check the sub regions, I can just click on this and then it takes me to interest over time or bonus date. Alright, so let's let's check Buhari. Let's see what's up with Buhari. Buhari from Betty Jay Z, that's the wrong search. So I'm gonna click on this. I think I'm gonna go. And for now, just compare Buhari in Nigeria. All categories what last 30 days whoa and what have you spoken about everywhere from Pasina to Kelly to Taraba and yes we can now see related searches for this person you can see the Buhari Democracy Day speech Muhammad Buhari Asha Buhari Democracy Form of Government Lecture Jigawa these are things other topics are related to what they are generating conversations that are mentioned behind in there and these are other search queries search keywords that people use in searching for things related to Buhari and if I want to compare him with say good dogs in the time let me use OC Banjo OC Banjo is more popular than a Sibanjo. That makes sense. So let's use something more interesting like the time. Right? So we could compare over the last 30 days who has more. So I'm going to use over the last 12 months because I mean good luck hasn't been in power for a long time. Or oh, say five years, and let's see if we come to show it's going to be more. Wow, where is still in all of it at this point from 2013 up to 2014? They were more or less competing in the same step of uh, once Bori got into power in 2015. Here we have wow, a lot of conversations in here. We're going to use in the last okay. So 24, 2004 to present, let's see. You can see Kudok was almost not known at the point. And then he rose in 2009, he was ahead for a bit. At one point in 2011, Buhari came up again. And then we have 2012, and then they were basically all the same all true to 2014 and then from october we already came and shut up again in 2014. all right so we can see the states that are talking about them this is interest of buhari in sub regions interest of related queries and we can see for of jonathan a lot of it in, in the south so in a nutshell, this is Google Trends. So you can compare different search terms, different keywords, gauge your interest over time. And if it's about your brand, you can then have an understanding and even interpret the graph based on the engagement or the conversations or even controversies that um, it's that's stemming from your brand. And you can see not just in the country, but you can also see in different states and see how popular you are in that state. And then you could also see different queries that you could also use like a keyword research tool to also improve what you're doing. And if I click on president, you 
this now gives me more information about that particular search query all right so google trends is really simple to use whenever you want to gain interest of people over time or compare between two search terms or between two people or between two states between two figures or products you can always check which one whenever you want to compare between two products or two figures or two celebrities who's more popular who's driving more conversation how is the conversation that's happening on twitter or happening on instagram or happening offline affecting trends online are friendly are affecting youtube search and new search and google search it's trends gives you all that information on the go and so this is why it's, it's a great market reality tool because it tells you as a now you can even see that you could drill down to in the last one hour and have an idea of how people are talking about you at this particular moment right it's such an amazing market reality tool all right so that's google trends next up we'll, i'll show you how to set up google alert and we'll be done with the practical section for introduction to digital marketing class with world fusion digital right and our third practical for the introduction to digital marketing class the world fusion digital center is how to set up google alerts to do this go to alerts.google.com alerts.google.com just as you can see on my screen Our Google Alerts is very simple. It's probably the most simple tool that we've spoken about today. All you need to do once you come here is what you want to create an alert for. This is like a social listening tool. You want to have an idea of what people are saying about you anywhere on the internet. So whenever your name is mentioned, you can easily get an alert, right? So if I add PCT me as an alert, it means that every time PCT me is mentioned anywhere on, on search, anywhere on the web, Google sends me an email address saying this name has been mentioned in so so, so place and this is what it looks like. Um, so you can create an alert by simply typing um, Wild Fusion. Digital Center. And I will click on Create Alert. And then I can go for that a day this alert and say how often do I want Google to send me an alert a day? And um, once a day or once a week or immediately happens. I want immediately happens. Where do I want this from? From news, from blogs, from web, from video. I want it from everywhere, right? No matter what it is, send me the alert for it. Any video, whether it's in Nigeria, it's in the United States, I want anywhere on the internet. I want all results, not just the best results. So I want to being in the know for everything and then where do i want them to deliver this alert so i want them to send me an email and so i'm going to update this alert so whenever i'm mentioned i could always do this if i want to add multiple alerts i could do that here too like add mod fusion let me see digital marketing agencies and leaders Okay, so these are examples of news alerts that it's going to bring for me. Let me, let me delete that again. Yes, exactly. So these are examples of things I might see. Digital marketing, training. So anything that has to do with digital marketing, Google is going to send me an alert so I can see if it's something that World Fusion can't seem to jump on. And that's easy way to create Google alerts. Right, so you can be in the know for every conversation that's happening about your product, about your market, about your competition, about your industry. If I want to get out, create an alert for my competition, it means I want to be in the know of what they are doing and what people are saying about them so that I can use that for my own advantage. That's basically how alerts are created. So you could do it for your brand name, you could do it for your website, you could do it for your email address, you could do it for your competitors, you could do it for your products, you could do it for specific things in your industry just so you can be in the know when people are talking about you or if you are featured anywhere on the internet or if there are people creating discussions or articles or blogs about something related about that particular keyword or that particular search term. All right? So again, just go to alerts.google.com or google.com slash alert forward slash alert and then you can create an alert and then you come on here come here edit it and customize your alert to whatever you want 
how often you want to send to them the sources the language the region what kind of results do you want and where do you want them to deliver it to all right then